This is technology, man. We're on. Thank you. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to our uh, first seminar of the uh, semester. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here among us uh, today uh, Dr. Les Atlas. He's, uh, Dr. Les Atlas uh, got his degrees, MS and uh, PhD, from Stanford University in 79 uh, and 84. And in 84, he joined University of Washington, where he's currently a uh, professor. He's, uh, he's got broad interests in, uh, in signal processing, in time frequency, uh, speech, uh, coding. And uh, he was uh, w w the chair of the uh, largest signal processing uh, uh, conference uh, in IEEE. And, uh, and he, he, uh, he's an IEEE fellow. And he's a member at large of the board on the board of governors uh, of IEEE Signal Processing Society, and uh, he's been doing some really interesting stuff recently in acoustics. And uh, in fact, uh, I, I invited him with that particular purpose to find out what we can learn from him about acoustics, as we we all have an interest here. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hamid. Um, and so the, I'll get right into my talk, but you can see that I'm acknowledging our sponsor and collaborators. And uh, the goals of the talk are, first of all, to um, motivate the need and utility for something called modulation representations, and then to provide a formal foundation and signal model for what's these modulation representations, something new. And um, after that, to argue that oh, non-negative and real modulation envelopes, which is what people have been assuming for the last 50 or 60 years, are inconsistent with modulation representations. In other words, there has been a, a, a kind of ad hoc way of doing this, which, which is quite wrong. And there is a right way of doing it that we're making progress on that I'll be reporting toward the latter part of my talk. And lastly, demonstrate some applications of this. So it's not just pie in the sky, it's very useful stuff. And what I'm going to start with is some definitions. And in particular, I'm going to call acoustic frequency what we normally call frequency. And I'm giving it the name acoustic frequency to differentiate it from the new concept, which is modulation frequency. Modulation frequency is what I'm going to be defining throughout my talk. Now, a well-defined and substantiated meaning, which hasn't come out there in the last 50, 60 years, would clarify what's naturally in the signal versus what's in the signal processing. Just like when you do a, a DFT, discrete Fourier transform, or do a spectral estimate, you're getting something which is an estimate of a true quantity. That true quantity is a Fourier transform. And we all agree what a Fourier transform is, and we have for many decades, if not centuries, what a Fourier transform is. But for modulation frequency, there isn't that foundation. That's our goal. And it also opens up the possibility of having really new signal processing tools that go way beyond what you could thought, think was possible before. Now let me start with an example signal. I think I'll use the mouse to do this. I'm going to play a metronome at 120 beats per minute. Just ticking away, exactly 120 beats per minute. Now, the thing that you hear in this metronome is what you think should be 2 hertz. 120 beats per minute is 2 hertz. Tick, tick, tick. That's what you hear. And when you do a spectral estimate of what comes out of a metronome, any spectral estimate, and you look down at 2 hertz, there's nothing there. There's noise. Okay. You hear 2 hertz, but you don't see 2 hertz. And maybe you just, uh, maybe I gotta zoom in. Let's zoom in a little. I've zoomed in the frequency axis. The best spectral estimate I can get. Okay, it's non parametric, but the best non parametric multi taper estimate I can get. Nothing at but noise at 2 hertz. There's no spike there at 2 hertz, but you heard 2 hertz, tick, 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 tick. Where is it? Some people say you need wavelets for this. Okay, well, let's try wavelets. Okay, I'm doing wavelet analysis of that same metronome signal. Nothing at scales corresponding to 2 hertz. The so wavelets don't solve the problem. So here's another similar problem that I'm going to relate for you. First of all, metronome signal with that 2 hertz doesn't show up with regular Fourier analysis. Let's talk about another problem. I'm going to show you a spectrogram, which is time versus frequency, of two people talking at the same time. Two. 
You know there's two people talking at the same time. There's a Spanish speaker and there's an English speaker. Let's do it again. Most people can pick out the fact that dos. one saying two, the other saying dos. When you look at the spectrogram, which is a standard representation of speech, time versus frequency, where the hotness or the brightness or the direction toward red is the energy of the signal, they're right on top of each other. They're not separable. They're not separable in time or in frequency. They're separable in our head quite easily. What is going on? So there's something fishy here in signal processing. There's something immature in our field. People think signal processing is a mature field. But this question about what's happening with that metronome, what's happening with these two talkers, kind of links to something that people have been thinking about for a long time, since 1939, in fact. 1939, here's a quote. Homer Dudley, Journal of Acoustical Society of America. I'm not going to read his quote because he's using old-time language. I'm going to reinterpret it. Speech and other acoustic signals are actually low bandwidth processes which modulate higher bandwidth carriers. Okay, so like our vocal track, for example, is moving around at a rate of 12 hertz, 6 hertz, 10 hertz. And if we wanted to put out a 12 hertz, 6 hertz, or 10 hertz signal itself that showed up in a spectrogram or, a, or Fourier analysis at that low of a frequency, our head would have to be as big as this room to launch that low frequency acoustic wave. We don't have heads that are as big as this room. Evolutionary, that's just not possible. In our heads, we might. Well, in our own heads, OK? We might think they're as big as this room. But evolutionary, it would be hard to walk around with a head that big. So what our system does instead is like an AM radio, though that analogy isn't perfect. It launches an acoustic wave at a higher frequency that it then modulates in some way. That's the model here. And that's what Homer Dudley was thinking <laughs> about when he said this. It's a good idea. What we're saying is basically blue is a signal we receive. In some form or another, that red line is where the information is, in some form or another. And that's how people have been treating it. They haven't had a rigorous background, which is what we're heading toward. And I'm going to talk about why the way they've been treating it has been immature and has been actually incorrect. Here's another example. Time versus frequency, another effect which is similar. When we perceive sounds that is either two separate sound sources through one ear, that they're coming from two objects versus coming from one object, when you look in time and frequency, the idea of what's called informational masking is rather complicated and unexplained. It's an open question of informational masking, of how you can hear multiple sources or whether they fuse together or not. There is not a good model for what's going on. People argue about terminology. They can't make progress in that area. So let me just, let me start here. Let me start with this concept of a modulation spectrum. What I'm going to show you first is what people have been doing in some form or another. And what I've got here, and, and the basic idea of a modulation spectrum itself is useful, but in terms of modifying signals, filtering signals is not, which I'll be getting to. So this is a spectrogram of a tone, something that I'm generated with MATLAB that has AM on it. That tone is at a frequency of one kilohertz. It's modulated at some rate. You can see in time it's going up and down in energy. Modulated sinusoidally. I know what that rate was because I wrote the MATLAB code. You can count the number of cycles over that one second period, but there's a name for doing that. It's called a Fourier transform. So this is a picture of a short time transform followed by, this is now key, some detection operation. This is not the Fourier transform only. This is a Fourier transform magnitude. In fact, the log magnitude to turn it into a color map. This detection operation is absolutely key because the next step is to now take a Fourier transform of each row of a spectrogram. If I take a Fourier transform of each row of a spectrogram, when there's no energy, it just stays white. When I hit this guy here, it counts the number of cycles in one second, and it says 18. It was modulated at 18 hertz. If I would have done this with the metronome, we would have seen 2 hertz. Now there's something else going on here that I'm going to get to. There's also some DC stuff. 18 hertz modulation, but also DC. In other words, think of your AM radio model. This is not overmodulated. There is carrier in there. That carrier in there is acting like DC in modulation. Why is it there? I put it there. Why is it there when you use a cheap AM radio receiver? Because that transmitter put it there. It did not overmodulate. And that's one model and one way looking at it. That's how people have been looking at it. And you know what? It's wrong in most cases, and I'm going to get to why. But this at least tells us this would have worked for the metronome. This would have told us it was 2 hertz. 
Here's an example of how you can use modulation spectra before I talk about the more esoteric details of how you can <coughs> modify signals based on their modulation spectra. In this case, we've got multiple sound sources inside of a building. And what we now have is outside the building a wireless network of sensors. The sensors are picking up sounds and they're trying to localize where the sources are inside of the building. And the key point is sound sources inside of the building can represent fans, they might represent generators, they might represent other things. And what you want to do is decide which of those sources it is. Okay, if you want to determine where the, the cooling fan is for the building, where the generator is for the building, you want to be able to classify where those are. Beam, beam uh, localizing where they are has to do with the array processing on this. So a key thing is, how can we use modulation spectra to do that? Here's an example of a time signal that comes from a hot water pump sound measured outside a building, outside the building that I work in. And you don't hear this hot water pump sound when you're standing outside the building. Humans don't hear it. It's below our hearing threshold. What we did is we took, in this case, one microphone. We took spectrograms of the signal that we got that had a fair amount of noise in it. And then we took modulation spectra by doing that second transform. We transform each row of a spectrogram, form a sequence of modulation spectra, and basically time average. A very simple operation that then showed these two bright spots. Whoops. Let me back up. When you want to point, it's better to use a pen. Okay. See these two bright spots here? Those two bright spots tell us that there's a source that's operating with a fan at that rate. It's a fan that has acoustic frequencies up around 400 and 800 hertz. It's modulating at about 3 hertz or 4 hertz, which is its rotation rate. It's a signature of that particular hot water pump that's there. So if I now go into four possible types of sound sources in a building that are measured with a very low signal-to-noise ratio, we've got a paper on this if you want to see the details, signal-to-noise ratios that are well under 0 dB, minus 5 to minus 20 dB signal to noise ratios. We want to classify which of those four sources it's, it is from the different sounds by doing different looks of the array. Standard model that was being used, which is Mel Capstra plus differ differential versions of them, using one or eight nearest neighbors was giving us better than chance, a little bit better than 50 percent where chance is 25 percent. Not good enough to use in practice. It's almost like guessing. Single modulation spectra without averaging was giving us results 90, on the order of 90 percent. Whereas when we time average, wait for a while and collect a bunch of modulation spectra, get that noise level down by averaging in time, we're almost at a perfect result. So that's one example of a quick application, very simple way of looking at these modulation spectra that's useful in practice. So let's now come back to the second problem I mentioned, which is multiple talkers. If we have people talking simultaneously, and the example I'm going to give you is, well, very prevalent. People talk over each other all the time. You hear it in a restaurant. You hear it on the phone when you have multiple people talking in a conference call. And we pull them apart pretty well. I'm deaf in one ear. Okay, I'm not perfect in a noisy restaurant. I don't do that well. But I still can hear that Spanish and English talker and know that they're there, even deaf in one ear. So it's not just the localization. What the heck is our auditory system doing? Well. I'm going to give you a demonstration, and I'm going to then, uh, then show you what, what it is. So what I'm going to show you is not independent component analysis. People pull sounds apart by independent component analysis. This is totally different. It can be added to it if you want. You can put it in a cascade with ICA. It's inspired by the human perceptual use of auditory grouping because the evidence is that this modulation feature I'm talking about with partners I've worked with is something that's measured in the higher levels of the auditory system. It is something we use. So I'll give you the demo first, and then I'll show you how we did it. <coughs> I'm going to do what I play what I did before, but a little more. One, One two, two, three. Single channel, two spot, two speakers. You know, you can hear what they are. Now let's go ahead and process to remove one of those two speakers. One, two, three. That was po that was processing the modulation spectra. I'll show you how soon. Now let's process to remove the other. One, two, three. Now, now that wasn't perfect, but we we knocked down the undesired talker by quite a bit, and that's not multi-channel; that's single channel. So let me show you what we did. <coughs> Modulation spectral transform, like I showed you. Mask out the undesired talker because suddenly they'll separate, as you'll see. They're not on top of each other, and then inverse transform. 
It's a new form of filtering. Let's, let's look at the details now, what that looked like. This left-hand side, I'm going to show you the, all, all those, the sequence of the uno, dos, trace is too long to show in a spectrogram, but I'm just going to show you the dos, which lasted about 450 milliseconds. This is the spectrogram here. They're on top of each other. There's no filter in time or in frequency that can separate them. Same time. Our ears here are separate. Our head does. This is the modulation spectra. Let me show you what's going on with it. <coughs> The pitch fundamental for the English speaker saying two stands out right there. The first harmonic for the English speaker saying two of its pitch is right there. It actually pitch aliases. An alias, this is pi, an alias back here. It turns out that aliasing is not a big problem. But it aliases just like we do in regular acoustic frequency. And there's the pitch for dos, the Spanish speaker said, playing, saying dos. Turns out that the action is way down here at the low frequencies. That's the rate of our vocal tract moving. And the vertical extent of the red is telling us what acoustic frequencies are coming from the English speaker. The vertical extent of the blue are telling us what acoustic frequencies <coughs> are coming from the Spanish speaker. So there's a time-varying <coughs> linear filter where the where the bandpass regions of the linear filter are a function of what we found in this modulation spectra. That's what took what we used, based on this picture, to convert this Those. to, for example, if we go ahead and only filter in the extent, uh, remove what's, what's in the blue region in terms of its vertical extent and acoustic frequency, we get two. And if we remove what's in the red region, we get Those. just like it should. So a time-varying linear filter with parameters driven by the extent and modulation spectra. So we're using modulation spectra as an energetic estimate in this case. It works pretty well. Now let me give you some other issues, some recent insights. If we want to use modulation spectra as a filter itself instead of an energetic estimate, if we want something that's like an LTI filter, we can put a signal in and remove modulation components that you don't want. Let's say it's speech and noise. The <coughs> modulation bandwidth of speech is about 2 to 12 hertz. And you've got modulation of m noise sources that are modulated at a much broader rate. You may want to make the speech more intelligible. You band pass and modulation frequency. That would be really nice to be able to do that. We tried to do that about five years ago. We tried very hard to do that. We found out it didn't work. Other people have tried, and this is why. first published in 2004. We looked at the problem theoretically, and this was a rather shocking result. The theory behind it is sound, and I'll defend it even more in the next few slides. For most acoustic frequencies, the modulation envelope, like I showed you in that picture with the, red, with the blue signal and the red envelope, it's not non-negative real. It's complex. It has to be complex. And the problem we've had is this sticking ourselves with polar form, OK? Magnitude and phase, forcing things to be in magnitude and phase is something we've been brought up with. It doesn't fit this problem, nor does rectangular form. I'm going to give you more <coughs> examples why. So previous methods of modifying modulation spectra, doing experiments with modulation spectra, have in general failed. People try to enhance speech using <coughs> modifying modulation spectra. It did some good, but it did more bad than good because of this problem, this assumption. It's not like a cheap AM radio receiver speech or other acoustic signals are put out in such a way that we guarantee that their envelope is non-negative and real. They might be overmodulated, for example. Coherent carrier detection is what's needed. You've got to be able to estimate what your carrier is to find out what the envelope is, just like an FM radio. A little bit harder in this case because the carrier might not be so narrow band, <coughs> might not be steady. More recently, which is going to appear in the next ICASP, it's not just the coherent carrier detection. The carrier has to be band limited. So the problem with polar form is you form a magnitude and a phase term. And if you want to modify each of those, each of those terms is not band limited. You put them together, you get the original signal back. OK? So people use things like Hilbert envelopes or all kinds of other tricks to modify the envelope. And they're breaking it into signals which are not band limited. You put a non-band limited signal on your computer and modify it, you're in trouble. How do you ever sample the thing? 
The only thing you can do is combine it back with the original phase and, and magnitude. Put those back together, you're safe. Other than that, you spread way across the subbands. You spread things that are now going to cause a mess if you make any modification. So the fundamental idea is if you want to modify modulation spectra, you've got to be careful about this. And here's another way of arguing that point from the standpoint of Fourier symmetries. Let's say that we're, we're what we're going to do, what we've been doing in the stuff I've shown you is breaking, <coughs> equivalent to breaking the speech signal that I worked with or the other chiller signal that we worked with into subbands, into bandpass filters. And how the energy falls in each of those subbands and the symmetry of it tells you whether the envelope is going to be non-negative or real or just real or actually complex. Let's talk about those symmetries. This is mathematical relationships having to do with Fourier transform symmetries. This is one of the subbands. After I do a spectrogram, I've broken it into a subband, let's say at one kilohertz. That center of that subband right at one kilohertz, if my energy that I receive from speech or from the chiller signal or from something else happens to fall perfectly symmetric, Hermitian symmetric, right about the center of that subband, I end up with a real and non-negative modulator. That's what people had been assuming is happening. Now, if I end up with something where it's symmetric but goes low in the center of the subband, Bochner's theorem tells you this. I end up with something which is real and partially negative. I'm overmodulated, but still real. Now, the most typical case is the subband center is something I designed when I did the MATLAB program. The signal that I received doesn't know about that. There is no symmetry where it falls in the center of the subband. So the general and the very likely case is that the envelope's complex. Let's take a look at a case. Let's look at a speech signal. I just grabbed one randomly. Well, let me make another argument here first. If this is the signal within the subband, and I now put it magnitude phase, where green is magnitude and red is phase, what people have been doing is, for example, square law detection, taking a magnitude squared. I can draw that picture, because now I take this magnitude term and I, I, I correlate it with itself, and I end up with a double frequency term. The phase, I don't know what to do with. So if I take magnitude squared as a detector, I end up with this kind of picture. Use the original phase, slap it back in, and hope for the best. It's not a good idea. A better idea is synchronous detection. Just slide it all down, figure out what the carrier is. Now let's go back to what the other slide implied. What does it look like? I grab one subband at random of speech. What kind of symmetry do I have? The subband response is in gray. The speech signal's in blue. There's no even symmetry there. Okay, this is not going to be non-negative real. Let's look at another one that I just, the second one I grabbed. There's no reason it's going to be non-negative real. We don't have the symmetry we need that pe people have previously assumed. So these are a couple papers that made the wrong assumption. One is a paper by Drollman, which was kind of the standard paper that people use to assume what parts of modulation are important in speech. What did it do? It used something called a Hilbert envelope that assumed the symmetry where the envelope was non-negative and real. It modified and filtered that non-negative real envelope. Another paper in Nature, Smith, Delgut, and Andy Oxenham, where they took the carrier from music and the, and the modulator from speech and then swapped them and looked at intelligibility. Both of these signals were trash. I'm sorry to say they were trash because of the lack of band limiting. <coughs> now, we're going to play some examples, but first I have a few other things to say. Let's look at where we're at now, just to remind you. What was done in those two papers I just showed you, supposed state of the art in doing modulation modification, is to do some base transform, which could be a, sh a short time for a transform, which is equivalent to an, uh, a, a DFT, overlapping DFT, producing a signal, if we just choose one of the subbands, say on the positive frequency, that's an analytic signal. We could use a Hilbert transform to do that if we wish. And then we use a magnitude term. We keep the original phase. We then do some filtering of that mm -hmm. magnitude term. We've assumed it's non-negative real. We do that over all subbands, the same kind of thing, sum it over all subbands. That's what the Drollman paper and the Oxenham paper did that I just showed you. This is what we propose instead. Take the base transform, demodulate coherently. Figure out what the carrier is in each subband. Find not the center of the subband, but the center of the energy. So you satisfy <coughs> the symmetry. Once you find the center of the energy, you end up with a complex envelope. It's a complex envelope. And you can still filter that complex envelope. Call the filter GFT. This filter can be LTI. We now put 
the, the conjugate of that carrier back in, we move it back up to where it was after it's been filtered, sum over all subbands to reconstruct. This now won't have that band as long as, as this, this term is band limited. It doesn't have a bandwidth problem. We're not breaking any rules when we do this. So let me give you an application of what I just showed you. This is ICAST 2006. And in this particular result, we were um, um, uh, working with three talkers. This is a tough case. Three talkers at the same time. They're all about the same level. There's one target talker. This is like a cocktail party situation. What we're trying to do is build a hearing aid that enhances the target talker and the presence of talkers you don't want. Again, it's single channel. So let me play this demo. You're going to hear three talkers. <coughs> one of them is going to change what they say between the, different, the three different tokens. They're going to say something different here, here, and here in those three cases. But the background talkers will say the same thing. Here we go. Bill might discuss the phone. Probably didn't get anything. No. <laughs> okay. Now let's try it again. The background interfering talkers will be the same. Desired talker will change. Bill might discuss the phone. Any idea? I know what they're saying because I've heard it already. Third case, same background, desired signal will change. Bill might now let's use coherent detection based modulation filter. This didn't work at all for the old incoherent way using Hilbert envelopes, but our coherent way, now let's try it. Birthday. You can get what that was? Birthday. Yeah, birthday. Birthday. Okay, we suppress the undesired talkers. Well, let's try this one. Drawbridge. Get it? Uh -huh. What is it? Drawbridge. Drawbridge, yeah. This one. Eardrum. What'd you get? Eardrum. 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 Yeah. <coughs> Do it again. So the difference is Eardrum. Eardrum. versus Eardrum. Okay. So when we did controlled testing, the intelligibility of the desired signal in the top one was basically zero, and the bottom one was not perfect, but much, much better, much better than chance. So it was a huge difference. The problem is there's still considerable distortion. Okay, If you put something like that in a hearing aid and people are hearing stuff that distorted, they're not going to be happy. <laughs> so so um, they will. intelligibility goes up, but usability doesn't necessarily go up. But your background no also changes. The background? Also changes. Oh, when the background changes, yes, of course. So how do you know which one is signal? Oh, this is trained up on the desired talker. It has been trained up exactly on the desired talker and um, only on the desired talker. So what, what makes the desired talker special? Is that tone of the voice or? It's his spouse. The modulation spectrum of the, we're filtering, the shape of the modulation spectral filter is based on the desired talker, <coughs> which is uh, it's actually jointed acoustic and modulation frequency. And that particular filter was trained up on plenty of utterances from the desired talker. And, uh, and, and so, so we're just filtering that person's voice out, voice characteristic out. Of course, that person comes with a cold, maybe it would change. <laughs> okay, so um, <coughs> move here. So uh, we still had distortion, so we had to go back to the theory. Just because that seems very promising, but it seems too processed. You know, it's just we're, we're processing it too hard is what, what they thought. So let's go back to a theoretical question. This is, it looks like some math, but it's actually very, very obvious. What I'm going to do is just back up to what we learned in electrical engineering as undergraduates. What should an ideal distortion-free filter do? You can take an input signal, x of t, you pass it through a filter. Let's call it an ideal filter, an ideal <coughs> low-pass filter. You can't build in a perfect low-pass filter, but you can get pretty darn close. 60 dB down, 90 dB down, something like that. Let's say it's an ideal low-pass filter, or very close to ideal. We now take the output of that filter and put it through the same filter. That should be a projection operation. We shouldn't change. Okay, obviously the filter is 60 dB down, you still got some stuff left over, but it's very, very close. So you pass through the filter twice, you've removed the frequencies you didn't want the first time, you kept the frequencies you did want, pass it through the filter again, there's no other change. So if the filter's ideal, this happens. In practice, a well-designed filter, you're really, really close. So most useful 
filters satisfy this property? Okay, very close. Approximately, but very close. Now, let's now look at what happens with a modulation spectral filter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give that projection property where you pass through a filter twice. I'm going to use the older Hilbert transform method of, modula of modifying the modulation envelope. We're going to see what happens. I'm going to start with a signal, which is just a speech signal. A few hundred milliseconds. Uh. Ah. I'm going to band pass it. I'm going to look at this. Ha this is true for all subbands, but this is one of the subbands that I chose. Now find its Hilbert envelope, which is a really good match to the envelope shape of that. Looks really good in time. Then now I'm going to filter the Hilbert envelope. That's my modulation filter right down there. Let's pass one through the filter. Is this guy right here? Now let's go to the next slide. I'm going to remodulate it. Bring it back up to that subband frequency. I'm reconstructing the original signal. Now I'm going to band pass it again a second time. This is now the second pass through. I'm going to find its Hilbert envelope the second time that I passed it through. I'm going to compare it from the first time. Very ideal filter that I passed it through, low pass filter. Okay, it was a, a FIR filter that was like 1024 order. The stop band was down um, 110 dB. Pass band was 1 dB with, an, with a ripple of about 0.1 dB. <coughs> Nothing wrong with the filter. A very narrow transition band. But look what happens. We want the blue and the red to match. Do they match? No, not even close. Why? Because this Hilbert envelope de reconstruction doesn't work because it's not band limited. This modulation filtering that people have been doing doesn't work. Now let's go ahead and try what I'm proposing, which is this coherent <coughs> detection. Same experiment. I'm using for the carrier something based on uh, uh, Pat Laughlin's work. Pat Laughlin got his PhD from me. And when he was finishing his PhD, I said, well, he's going to the University of Pittsburgh. I said, what are you going to work on? He said, instantaneous frequency. I said, what are you going to do that for? That seems kind of like a stupid thing to work on. Well, 10 years later, I'm using it. That's how these things work. So Pat Laughlin, working with his PhD student, came up with a spectral center of gravity that also resembles what Papoulis did in <coughs> 1983. This is the way we estimate the carrier, simply a center of gravity. There's theoretical reasons we use this. The most important one is it's band limited to the subband. It makes some assumptions I needn't go into now. It's in a paper. But let's now try the same experiment. So I'm going to use the same test signal. And the reason I call this uh. the Gitza property is as Odin Gitz is the first one who noticed the problem on the last few slides with the Hilbert envelope technique. I didn't believe his result because it was so bad, the red and the blue, that people were using. And when I called up Odin, I thought it was the reconstruction part across the subbands that was causing the mess. He said, no, that's in each subband. I had to hold the phone like two feet from my ear. He was screaming at me to tell me, yes, it really is that bad. So that was the old result. Now let's try it the coherent way, using the Papoulis or Laughlin Center of Gravity approach. Same signal, band pass it. Coherent modulator. This actually is a complex signal. MIFT is now complex because I'm doing this coherently. I'm only showing you the magnitude because that's all I can show you. Okay. Now I filter it. It's also complex. The complex signal goes to the filter, but again, I only show you the magnitude. Note how it's crossing zero with a jump of pi in its phase there. Now let's run it through the filter the second time. Ideal filter. Remodulate it back up, band pass it again, go through the um, uh, uh, coherent, um, find the coherent modulator. Does the blue match the red? Yes, exactly. They're exact matches now. So it's doing what it should. So you have to do coherent detection. This is a speech signal. Any signal you observe in nature where you don't have the carrier in hand, okay, or someone didn't throw the center of the carrier symmetry in the middle of a subband for you, you got to do this. You've got to do uh, synchronous detection. So let's go ahead back to this Roman paper, this JASA 94 paper. Their claim was that if you used a low pass cutoff frequency of 2 hertz, <coughs> broke the speech into subbands one octave wide, a 1 hertz low pass cutoff would provide, in modulation frequency, not acoustic frequency, would provide speech with an intelligibility of 92%. That point right there. Okay? So I'm going to play for you the original speech, then I'm going to play the, the classic Drollman approach. I duplicated their methods. And then I'm going to play what happens when you use the coherent approach. So remember, they claim that that point should be way up 
there, high intelligibility. Let's see what really happens when you do it right. Here's the original speech. A joint project between United Parcel Service and the EPA has led to a test vehicle that burns considerably less fuel because of an innovative hydraulic system. So now what we're going to do is, is try to, what Hilbert, what, he, what Drollman and his colleagues were trying to do is filter it so only two hertz modulations and lower were coming through. Like taking someone's vocal tract and slowing it down. That's what's supposed to happen. Well, let's listen to what, what their uh, approach gave. A new project between the United Parts Service and the EPA has led to a test vehicle that burns considerably less fuel because of an innovative hydraulic system. What do you hear? You hear harmonic distortion, you hear echo, <coughs> you hear buzziness, okay, rumbling kind of sound, but it doesn't sound like the modulation slowed down. And that was quite intelligible. Okay, the result they have, I believe that it's 92% intelligibility. The intelligibility is there. You've done something to signal. I'm not sure that it is intelligible. If you played it the other way around, I'm not sure that you would have understood what they were saying. Well, but their experiment you, was careful, yeah. But yeah, but, but if you played it, in other words, you, you, you're saying it's intelligible because you have a prior. You heard that thing before. Yeah, I'm not doing careful methods with this audience, yeah. obviously. Okay. okay, but it but it is, you know, so you're not, I'm not 100% sure that that passage would have been intelligible. But his measurements were very careful. At the, with those parameter settings, the intelligibility wasn't perfect, but it was 92%. Now, what happens when you use a coherent approach? It sounds much, much worse. That's the point. It sounds like you've taken someone's vocal tract and grabbing their joy, you know, that kind of thing. And the way to check that out, it's not intelligible. You know, that was not intelligible. You know the prior, it's still not intelligible. Right. It's not even close. So let's take a look at spectrograms. Here's the original one. The one that we were talking about <coughs> from the Drollman experiment. The new project between the United Parts Service and the EPA has led to a test vehicle that burns considerably less fuel because of an innovative hydraulic system. Two hertz low pass filter. Look at this is seconds here. There should be smearing in this x in this x-axis direction. There's no smearing. There's distortion. There's harmonic distortion. There's no smearing. What kind of low-pass modulation filter is that? The modulations haven't been low-pass. You've introduced distortion. Whereas our coherent method is smeared, smeared in this dimension. You don't see these gaps anymore because we've smeared over them. That's what it was supposed to do. Now this isn't a speech enhancement system. This is just confirming that the experimental result. That they, that they were using, the methods they were using for signal processing were bogus. And there is indeed a method that can be used. And that that low pass result should have intelligibility that's much, much lower. Just one example to show that. So let me go on with a few other things. Let me give a practical example of how you can use this stuff to improve things, not to make them worse, but to improve things. So a common problem is if you're recording out in the field is one noise on microphones, okay? You've got a microphone. It's an inexpensive one. If I was standing in a windy environment now, this would be picking up wind noise, the mic that I'm wearing. Um, and this is speech in this picture. <coughs> if I click on the picture, you don't have to worry about the lines. Right now, you're going to hear the original speech with the wind noise. The new birth is immediate and instantaneous. OK, you hear poof, poof. I'll play it again. The new birth is immediate and instantaneous. Here's a big hunk of wind noise right there. Now what I'm going to do is modulation filter this in such a way to just keep the speech modulations and remove the wind noise. That's going to be the next slide. I'll play it. Now this is done coherently. If I did this incoherently, it'd sound like trash. Clean. A little bit of wind noise if you listen really carefully. Play it again. So it's not terribly intelligible to begin with. But studies are underway to determine the improvement in intelligibility after this kind of processing. The results are looking very promising. So you, if, you, if, if you use the right kind of signal processing, you, it's a new form of filtering. You can remove things that are broadband noise sources, white noise sources that are impulsive in a way too. So some conclusions is a modulation spectrum, when defined the usual way by real and non-negative envelopes, 
is ineffective and causes artifacts. People have been doing that 50 years. They've been stuck with this polar form. Polar form is, is, an, is not right for this. Coherent detection seems to offer a deeper and more effective definition. <coughs> now, we're not done with this. Some opportunities are, there's some theory questions that are left over here. This is just the start of an area. It's not the end of the area. If you want to do some modulation filter, what's the modulation frequency operator? Fourier frequency operators minus J, D, D, omega. Okay? That's been known for a long time. That's a very profound operator. It has some really nice properties, like its commutator is, is, a, is a constant. Okay? Is there an operator that explains what we should be doing with modulation frequency that's just as powerful? Or is there an eigenfunction of modulation filtering that exists, just like an eigenfunction for a for our LTI filters, EJ omega n for discrete time. Another question, what's the optim optimum maximum likelihood estimate of mi of t? Here's a model. We receive a signal r of t, which is a sum, say over subbands or over something else, of modulators times carriers, product model, plus noise. The carrier is, and, and noise are random. They're Gaussian, for example, and independent. mi of t is deterministic. That's what you're after. Given R of T, estimate MI of T. What's the maximum likelihood estimator for that? Now, people have worked on that problem using, and it's called demon processing, using magnitude-based estimators, okay? Not coherent estimators. And the maximum likelihood solution to that is not closed form. It's far from that. Every couple pages, Nielsen did a paper. He has to expand into a Taylor series and drop higher order terms. At the end of things, he's able to say that, it's, that the magnitude is optimal, but He's left off so many higher order terms, you don't know if it's true or not. Whereas when you look at the maximum likelihood expression you get from this, much, much cleaner, it's quadratic. You find a single minima. The math looks right. Modulation spectral tools are likely useful as an adjunct to current signal processing. It's another temporal or spatial dimension to filter in. Our heads use it, why not use it in practice? Hearing aids and cochlear implants. We've got a project going on with cochlear implants where the, where the subjects can now hear melodies based on the timing <coughs> that comes from this modulation information. Acoustic analysis, including generalization to arrays. If I'm now able to estimate a complex envelope coming to different microphones in a room or different receivers of some kind, can I do a better make a better estimate of the wavefront that's coming to these microphones and thereby work back to where the source was with much more accuracy in the presence of noise? Um, acoustic enhancement, like I just played for you in various applications, and lastly, underwater applications, be it biosonar, whales, and stuff like that, or what's called demon processing, improving that. So that's the end. Thank you. We have uh, some time for questions. Any questions? Uh -huh. Yeah. Is the modulation frequent spectrum of a person fixed even if he's saying different words? Or different oh, of course, words? the modulation spectra varies slowly over time. So it's like a fundamental property like the pitch of a person. Well, well, I would say that, okay, so the, if, if, if I was really to show a modulation spectra of my speech or your speech, you'd want to watch a movie with a frame rate of about four frames per second. So every 250 milliseconds, it would be a picture that changes. So, so in other words, it's, it's much lower frame rate than a spectrogram, for example, which is every 10 or 30 milliseconds. So is there a way where we can uh, associate a fixed template to a person? It looks like that, but we certainly haven't looked at that enough. Um, you know, I, in terms of empirical studies, we're, we're, we're <coughs> not that far up the, the curve in empirical studies because we're trying to work the theory out here. But that, that's the kind of thing we're working on. But the evidence is from that enhancement result that I played you for that particular case, where we use a large training set to train up the filter for that one desired talker, that that may be true. Yes? Um, has this sort of a technique been um, used for karaoke and other applications? Oh, yeah, karaoke. <laughs> I was, but I really, uh, that's a good question. This is what I'd like to do. This is a killer app. You walk up to a karaoke machine and you sing, and out comes Frank Sinatra's voice, <laughs> okay? You're driving it with the pitch and so on, but it's got the tone, the tonality of Frank Sinatra or Elvis's voice or whoever it is. Okay, you, you demo something like that in Sony, they, they sign the license agreement right there, okay? <laughs> so that obviously we're thinking in those directions to be able to, to modify or more, not morphing, but, but take part of, part of uh, untrained singer's voice with a, a very historically you know, important singer's voice. It'd be really cool. Yes? How 
quickly can you train your filter? How quickly can we? Can you train your filter? Oh, it depends on, on how, how broad we want to make it and how large our training set is. But the training that we used for the example that I showed you took uh, a few hours on, of computer time. Okay. Yeah, it was rather complicated. But that was actually using MATLAB. So if you coded it up in C, it might have been a few minutes. No, I just wonder if I can selectively listen to the conversation among the crowds. So we'll yeah, we really don't know, the, we don't know the size of the training set needed yet to be able to know how low we can get that training time. Okay, but we just we just trained a long time to make sure, for <coughs> example. Yes? Do you use one of your training examples as your test examples? No. So you, they're in totally independent in all those cases. Yes? So carrier estimation seems to be very critical. Yes, so oh, you bet it is. So um, is, is there some magic there? I mean, well, the carriers are temporal or are they Steady over time, or they're just—they're not steady. The well, it depends on what the source is. See, the thing about uh, like a generator in a building, generator in a building has a carrier that's very—it may not be in the center of the subband, but it's very steady in time. Mm -hmm. So you can have an estimator, you know, that center of gravity estimator. You let its time limits go as long as you wish, and it's steady, and you get a nice clean estimate, even if the SNR is minus 20 dB. But if it's speech, it's moving around on you. It's the pitch of speech, basically, and all the harmonics are, are what the carriers are. And so if someone's pitch is moving really fast, you've got, you know, um, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. Depends how accurate you want it to be. And if that's in the presence of noise, well, you heard in the wind noise, we were, well, that's a, we, we actually had to be pretty careful to get that right. But that was, but that was a, a estimate, basically the same as an estimate of the pitch. We did not use a harmonic model for that uh, uh, wind noise removal. And if we did, it might even work better. Other questions? I have another question. Sure. In the, in the cocktail party type of uh, application, have yes. you uh, compared that with like the ICA? I mean, it's the, apples and oranges. Why not combine? No, 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 no. no. But, but, but the, I mean, uh, you know, the community, the ICA community. Yeah. I mean, they, they've long sort of boosted the, 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 the Yeah, the, but they need multiple microphones. It, okay. Oh, this that's, is one. That's right. Yeah, that's right. This is one. So, so that's why I say it's complementary. If you have only one mic available, okay, a couple of things. First of all, ICA needs needs at least as many microphones as sources, and that's right at the edge. Mm -hmm. So, if you're in a noisy environment, that may not work for the unmixing. Okay. So, it, let's say you're in a restaurant or something like that, and you're trying to trying to get. No, there's actually uh, there's there been some recent, more recent work where they did away with that thing, where they actually have less. They can have less, less sensitivity. sensitivity. Yeah, less that's sensors. Oh, and that's Tequan Lee yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay, but they still they still need multiple. Yeah, they do need multiple. This is single. So so uh, it's I still think it's apples and oranges. The main reason why is I think ICA is great. Why not combine it with this? Mm -hmm. I don't want to compete with it. Okay, if someone is is, is trying to make make um, a good audio system, they want good filters. They want good A to D converters. You don't com you don't have the filters competing with the A to D converters. So that's the analogy. And you don't want to make enemies. Either, so. No, well, the, the, you know, and that that area is quite mature, and and it, and it, it really is ample. You know, there isn't anything incremental I can add to ICA, nor can ICA add to this stuff that I can think of. Yeah. Maybe someone else can. It really is distinct things that can cascade. Yes. yes can you tell me what happens when it, if you you've got a single microphone and you're moving around a room? where there might be absorbency and things of that nature. Have you dealt with that? Oh, you know what? This modulation spectrum is not sensitive to the LTI change. It's wonderful, especially with that building case, because LTI differences, linear time invariant differences, that'll be, um, um, obviously, if you're moving fast, you've got a problem. But, but if you're moving slowly, a change in LTI is not picked up in the modulation spectrum. If you want to pick up a change in LTI, <coughs> use regular Fourier spectrum. Mm -hmm. So we're insensitive to that, mm -hmm. which is which is good. We're insensitive to uh, assuming you you get some signal. We were insensitive to the any LTI distortion and echo and stuff like that. All right, there are no more questions. Let's thank our speaker again.